Hallelujah. We have, uh, I think this is the fourth week in our series uh, that we've called Believe the Gospel. And the first week we talked about repentance and what repentance really is. It's not what uh, maybe many of you have thought that it is. Um, it's not necessarily feeling sorry for your sins. Um, it literally means to change your mind. So godly sorrow, so sorrow does play a component. Obviously, we don't deny feelings and you should feel bad about some things in your life if you've got some things that are ungodly in your life, but godly sorrow should lead you to changing your mind about how you're to live, right? And so uh, we talked about some things about that, and, and if you go back and, and watch uh, part one, I believe that you'll be very blessed. But then the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, forgiveness, amen? How many of you have been here the last couple of weeks talking about forgiveness? Is it ministering to you? Yeah. yeah? Uh, forgiveness, we're talking about godly forgiveness and how forgiveness really works in the kingdom. And uh, it's oftentimes backwards from how we as uh, fallen, um, it, living in a fallen world, let me say it that way, living in a fallen world, uh, sometimes selfishness gets to be so prevalent in our world that it's difficult to live against the grain sometimes. I understand that when somebody hurts you, it is much easier to try and snap back at them. I get that. As a human being, I get that. But today we're going to talk about literally, uh, so the first two weeks we talked about forgiveness, what it is, right? The Greek word aphiomi literally means to send away, uh, to send forth, to disregard. Uh, we talked about when we were forgiven, right? We were forgiven at the cross of the Lord Jesus because of what Jesus did. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or literally no forgiveness of sins. So it's because of what the Lord Jesus did for us that we have forgiveness of sins. And we've been forgiven past tense. Yeah. Amen? We've been forgiven past tense. Now this is the part, um, th th you start talking along these lines and people really get their religious feathers ruffled. Because they're so conditioned to living out of their feeling realm that they they don't understand spiritual, um, not just spiritual law, but spiritual truth is, is that's the Bible word. It's it's a truth that you're forgiven. Now the facts may not line up with that. You may not feel forgiven. How many of you know, I, I taught a, a, a long time ago, I don't know if it was a, a series or one week or whatever, but I've said this multiple times, that truth will trump fact, right? right? Yeah. Truth always trumps fact. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, it's a fact that you can't walk on water, but truth walked on water. I, I'm not, I don't have time to go through this, but there are a lot of facts that get trumped by truth. The kingdom realm trumps this physical realm. In fact, this, this world changes when the kingdom comes on the scene. Yes. Yes. Amen? Amen? This world, the kingdom is what absolutely is the only thing that can change this realm. Right. People say, well, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, you have no idea how to live a kingdom life. You will not believe it when you see it. Most of the time, people don't believe things that they see. They see it, and it's awesome, and then they say, what do they say? Well, that's unbelievable. <laughs> very first thing they say is it's unbelievable. They walk out of church saying, oh man, church was so unbelievable this morning. Well, what you just said, I'm not being legalistic, but what you just said is you just walked out and said, I don't believe anything that happened in there. <laughs> Why are you being legalistic, pastor? Because Satan is a legalist and he'll try and take the things that come out of your mouth and try to make them reality in your life. He'll try to solidify those things. Yeah. Yeah. The believer doesn't, I don't see it when I believe it, Excuse me, I just said it, I said it right away. I don't believe it when I see it. I actually see it when I believe it. Yes. Right? Yes. So that's how the believer's called to live. We have to live contrary to how the world lives because if we don't, we'll not be able to change the situations and circumstances around us. The Bible never talked about, there's never ever a situation, whether it's uh, David and Goliath, right? Maybe you, got, you guys have heard, uh, don't ever talk to God about the giants in your life. Talk to the giants about the God in your life, right? Yeah. So you're always to talk to the giant, talk, speak to the mountain. You're, we're called to talk to the situations and circumstances that are standing contrary to us. Speak to the storm, talk to the wind, talk to the waves, right? Yeah. And that's, the, that's it's a major difference. I don't, I don't mean to, uh, I, I will say this, I, you know, I'm not really 
speaking about any church in particular, but there's a huge swath of the church world that likes to talk about storms. And every time they talk about storms, it's like, just, it's okay. Jesus is in the boat with you. Just, you know, bear out the storm. You know, it, it's okay. Just stand through it. You know, the tests and trials of your life, stand strong. No, it's not about standing strong. It's about knowing who you are in Christ Jesus and speaking to the storm and watching it absolutely subside. Yeah. People have been living in storms in their life for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and they don't understand why it won't go away, but yet they're too timid to talk to it. I'm serious. You ask them. You say, well, what have you said to it? Oh, I, I couldn't dare do that. I'm not Jesus. Well, he woke up, and when they came and woke him up in the back of the ship, he spoke to the storm, right? And then he spoke to the sea and commanded it, said, peace be still. And then he turned around and said, why didn't you do this? Yeah. So don't tell me you're not supposed to speak to the storm. The storm is not there. You know, I heard somebody recently say, I don't want to get myself in trouble, but I heard somebody recently say, it's okay, just know in the storm that God's in control in the storm. No, he's not. He's not. Some of you guys know when this peasant virus started a year and a half ago, and I started uh, sharing some things about not living in fear and walking by faith and all these kind of things. One of the things, one of the very first things that I said, the Lord actually ministered this to me because I heard somebody <clears throat> on social media, it was, a, it was a Christian who meant very well and was, was talking about uh, staying in unity through this whole issue. And, and he said something to the effect of, well, I think he said verbatim, that we're all in the same boat here. And Holy Spirit spoke up very strong in my spirit and said, don't you believe that for a minute? He said, you are all in the same storm, but you are absolutely not all in the same boat. Right. Now, that seems very harsh. That seems very, um, it, it would seem on the surface to be anti-love, anti-compassion. But I think it was anti-compassion when Jesus, I, 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 let me say it this way. I think that it also looks or appears to be anti-compassion when Jesus told all the church leaders that they were of their father, the devil. On the surface, that looks anti-compassion. But if you dig to the heart of the matter, it was the most compassionate thing he could have said to him. Yes. Yes. Amen. The, you don't ever grow out of the place that you are by somebody coddling you in the place you are. Right. Come on. That's right. Amen. Amen. We're called to yeah, some of you that are that are parents. You prod your children on. You see potential in them and you know more about what they're able to accomplish than they know about themselves. It's your job to pull that out of them. Yes. Don't you think Holy Spirit's doing the same thing? Yes. Well, I just, I'm supposed to live in my comfort zone because he is the comforter. No, you've got that completely backwards, baby. That What that means is you need to step out and he will comfort you yes. outside of what you think your perceived comfort zone is. Yes. He's the comforter in any situation you're called to deal in, called to live in, called to walk in, called to talk in, called to minister in. He'll make you, he'll, he'll give you comfort in that place. Yes. Amen? Amen. So I want to talk today about forgiveness and what I want specifically specifically to talk about is what is your response? Because we talked about, I don't want to do too much rehash of the first couple of weeks. Please go listen to those last two weeks. I'm telling you, it probably is not what you've heard about biblical forgiveness. I'm just saying. I mean, people get upset when you start talking about things that all of your sins are forgiven, are forgiven, past, present, and future. People hate that. Religious people hate that. They literally cannot stand to hear things like that. Well, what do you mean? How can, how can all my sins be forgiven? Well, when were your sins forgiven? At the cross. Well, how many of your sins were future sins at the cross? So how is it hard to believe that God could forgive sins in the future, can pre-forgive things? Let me give you an illustration. I mean, I'm being serious about this. And somebody, I shared this one time and somebody came up to me after church and everything but stopped short of calling me a liar after church. But I shared this several years ago. Jennifer and I, I literally forgave my daughter and my son. I've got two, two kids. I forgave my daughter and my son for everything that they could ever possibly do, anti, you know, God's will for their life and all that kind of stuff. I've already done it. Guess when I did it? When I decided to become a parent. Yeah. Now, get this. Get what I'm saying. How can you possibly do What if they spray painted your car? 
What if they did this? What if they did that? What if they burnt the house down? What if they, you know, absolutely messed everything up? What if they ran off and joined the circus? I don't know. What if? There's a hundred thousand what ifs. What if all that happens, pastor? I forgive them. I forgive them now. Why? Because I, if I'm going to commit to being a loving father, if that's my commitment, if my commitment is to love them at all times and to pull the best out of them, I have to forgive them. I don't have a choice about the matter. In fact, I'm supposed to forgive them 490 times. And if you read the context in the Greek there, 490 times every 24 hour period. And sometimes it feels like I've done that. Amen. And all the parents said, Amen. Amen. I mean, it feels like that sometimes, right? That's, I mean, it's okay to admit to those things. It's, it's tough uh, in the flesh. It's tough to do these things. But I want to talk about what our response is. Because now that we've talked about what repentance is, it's changing our mind. You, some of you guys are repenting right now. Now, you're not at the altar, and you're not crying to God, and you're not telling him how horrible you've been, but you're repenting right now. You're, I mean, you're Bible repenting. What the Greek says, you're changing your mind about your world right now. Some of you right now have never heard some of these things. But now here's the thing. There is a response. Because we live in a fallen world, um, and honestly, all the more because we live in a fallen world, we should be driven continually. I'm talking about continually by a forgiveness mindset. Here's the problem. We are living in a realm that is dominated. Look at your neighbor and say, absolutely dominated. <laughs> dominated by a selfish mindset. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got to live out forgiveness and walk out forgiveness in the middle of a place where we walk around and 90% of the people we talk to, and that does include some church people, are, it's all about them. All they can think about is them. All they can think about is how they can, you know, promote themselves or how they can get to the next place in life. And usually they use people to do it. It's true. That's why people come in sometimes upset with the church and they have, they see, they have preconceived notions about the church. I'm, I'm going to talk uh, for a minute about money. Okay. Where money is concerned, for example, because the love of money is the root of all evil. Right. So remember in that verse of scripture, money is not even the subject of that verse. Right. Love is the subject of that verse. Okay, so take money out of the equation for a minute. It's the love of whatever you desire and are pressing for. How many of you know that you will turn towards, you will worship, the, the ultimately, when we're talking about God, you will worship the thing that you love the most. You will give yourself wholeheartedly to the one that you love the most or the thing that you love the most. So some people uh, walk in here and say, well, you know, all the church wants is your money, right? And I've said this a hundred times before. And you guys know that that's not the truth. McDonald's wants your money. Walmart wants your money. Everybody else that you see, uh, what's, that, what's that place called with the bracelets? Pura Vida. Pura Vida wants your money. All you teenage girls, Pura Vida wants your money. They got these little necklaces and anklets and stuff. They want your money. They will market to you. They will absolutely do everything they can to get some of your money, right? The church... It's not about the money, it's about the call, it's about the purpose. Yes. I understand that money, the, the money that you have in your pocket, how many has, uh, I'm not calling anybody else out, but who has a $100 bill in here? I can use for an illustration. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I know somebody. Doug's probably got 20 of them in his pocket. <laughs> you have a $100 bill? I have 520s. 520s, well, that's the same thing, right? Okay. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. I was just gonna use 100 because, because it, uh, you know, it's big. What's that? Oh, yeah, I knew you guys. Now, that, now they're, all, they're all ready, right? $100. Right here. I'd, I wouldn't care if all five of these were $100 bills. I've seen $1,000 bills. I used to be in banking. I've seen $10,000 bills before. They usually only use those for international exchanges and stuff like that. Um, like when our government sends it to corrupt nations and things of that nature, they usually send $10,000 bills. But anyway, we won't talk about that today. But I, it doesn't matter if you had a pocket full of $10,000 bills. Here's the thing. Those, those pieces of paper, and I understand that that's really linen. They're woven together. But uh, those, they're basically green pieces of paper with dead men's pictures on them. That's what they are. And if one of them says one, you esteem it as one. 
But if the next one says 20, you esteem it 20 times as much as the one. And if one says 100, now all of a sudden, now it starts getting your attention. Now if we start talking about having a pocket full of them. Now listen here. That money in your pocket is the least valuable thing that you own. So here's the problem that people have with money in the church, for example. They think that money is, is the source of all this, and what they think really just reveals their heart. Right. I'm not going to go there right now, because, <laughs> but anyway, if, if that's what you think, then you just understand that your heart is revealing something to you. It do, you do good to listen to it, and you do, do really well to understand where your heart is, because only when your heart is right can you change the way you think. But now, if you think money's valuable, you're going to do everything you can to worship it and to get more of it. If, now I'm, I'm going to uh, understand worship. I'm using that word very lightly because my wife is not God. Um, I, I understand that. But I will, in an earthly sense, do everything I can for my wife. If I love her, I will do everything I can to have more time with her, to give myself to her. The thing that you or the person that you love is the person or the thing that you're going to give yourself to, right? So most people don't understand the concept that you're supposed to love people and use money. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Most people get that backwards. Money. They love money and use people. Yeah. But now, here's the thing. When you get people first and you get God's call on your life as a minister of the gospel, which everybody else, in, everybody in this room, if you're a believer, you're a minister of the gospel. You have an administration of the gospel, right? To minister the gospel of reconciliation and other things. Um, we won't go there right now. But if that's forefront on your list, you'll spend money to buy a meal for somebody. You'll spend money to help you know, pay their electric bill. You'll spend money to help somebody. Now, I'm not talking about enabling a poverty mentality, enabling a laziness mentality. There's a very fine line to walk because there are people that will use that compassion and you've got to be able to see through them, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm not talking about being blindly led astray and being a, a bad steward of what God's given, called you to give, okay? Um, but you'll, you'll turn right around to use the blessing of the kingdom. There's a, there's a connection to forgiveness here. Just stick with me for another minute. You'll use the thing that you've been blessed with to bless somebody else. The reason I use that example today is because we're talking about forgiveness, and if you truly or when you truly understand forgiveness and how much you've received from your father, you will fall all over yourself to forgive other people. If you don't, and if you're in a mindset that I can't possibly be pleasing to God, I can't possibly this, he can't really love me or whatever, then if you think in any way subconsciously that it's your job to make yourself more worthy to be forgiven, then you are going to look at your neighbor and you're going to think that that person has got to be more worthy for you to forgive them. So you're constantly going to hold things over their head and you're going to treat them the complete opposite as, as the way that God's treated you. Let's read, in fact, uh, an example of that in Matthew chapter 6. Um. This is, of course, in the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> and I'm going to read two verses. I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. And then I want to break them down a little bit and look at a couple different ways that you can see this. Verse 14 says this, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. I'm going to read that again. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, reading that, that seems awful law-driven. Pastor, looky there. Jesus put a condition on forgiveness. If you don't forgive, God can't forgive you. And it says will. That must mean future, future tense. Um, 
I don't want to get too much into dispensationalism. He's preaching this sermon before the cross. And before anybody throws rocks at me or before anybody starts writing nasty emails, um, you got to really be very cautious how you interpret the words of Jesus. Yes. When I first started uh, preaching, somebody, some well-meaning person said to me, stick with the red letters. You can never go wrong preaching people to follow the red letters. Well, I learned really quickly that that's not really true. Because if we preach everything that Jesus said as a condition for us now, then one of the things he said is if your eye offends, you pluck it out. He says, if your hand offends, you cut it off. How many has ever cut off their own arm in here? How many has ever plucked out your own eye? So you agree with me that not every word that Jesus says is for us in the new covenant. All right? So I know that, again, I know some of these things are, go cross grain of what you're conditioned to think. But here's the thing. You've got to understand some things Jesus said as a prophet of the old covenant. Some things Jesus said to show men and to pull out their guilt. In fact, Romans chapter 3, verse 19, uh, gentlemen, if you'll put that on the screen, Romans 3, 19, this is one of the verses of Scripture that you need to commit to memory. If you don't memorize the verse, you at least need to understand where it is and how to get there quickly. Because this is part of... Um, let me just say this before we go, before we put, you, know, you take that off the screen here for just a second. Before we go there, I want to say this again. I, I didn't finish my thought. So some things Jesus said as a prophet of the old covenant, some things he said to show people to be guilty, to prove that they needed a savior. Other things he said as a forerunner of the new covenant, right? In fact, he said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, to love your neighbor as yourself. He was talking to people at that point in time, the day he said that, he was telling that to people to whom it was impossible for them to do it. Yes. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, they, he hadn't gone to the cross yet. He hadn't been raised from the dead yet. The love of God had not been shed abroad in their hearts yet like it has been in your heart. So he was telling people that they had to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and might, and to love their neighbor as themselves. And he was speaking to masses of people at the time who literally, it was impossible for them to do it. So you've got some things that he says to another crowd of people who were under an old covenant that we are not called to live that way. He said other things to people in the old covenant that were about the new covenant and they couldn't fathom it yet. It's important that you understand what I'm saying, because I'm, I'm not, I don't want anybody going away from here thinking, well, pastor said you don't have to do everything Jesus said. Now, listen, when you start overgeneralizing things like that, it makes me sound really bad. It makes you sound ignorant. I'm not saying that, okay? Jesus is the epitome of love, and we absolutely need to uh, hold fast to every, the heart of everything Jesus said, but every bit of the, you know, the little bit of bits and pieces of the law, sometimes he answered and said, they tried to trick him a couple of times and they said, well, what do you think about this? And he said, well, Moses said in your law, blank. Well, okay, I'm not under that law, a covenant. I'm a new covenant believer. I'm not under the old covenant. So I don't have to do things how Moses said to do it. You understand what I'm saying? Is everybody on the same page? Hold up at least one hand and say yes. yes. All right? Okay. So if that's the case, then we've got to read these verses of Scripture in Matthew chapter 6 with a new covenant mindset. Part of that new covenant mindset is this, Romans 3.19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So the law, anytime the law is declared, its purpose, the law's purpose is to show the world that they're guilty and to stop every mouth that might think that they have some kind of righteousness on their own. That's what the law does. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56, if you'll please put that on the screen. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Now the sting of sin carries a lot of weight. Amen. Sin is, is a really, is a really bad thing. The sting of death is sin. First Corinthians 15, 56. And the strength of sin is the law. The law is literally, literally what gives sin strength. Romans chapter seven is 
is a masterpiece. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul shared exactly down to the very detail of how that works. See, that's the chapter where he said, all the things I want to do, I can't do. And all the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing them continually. And he says that the, the reason is, I'll just get to the, the punchline. The reason is, is because he said the law is holy and just and good. But the kicker is the law can never make you holy, just and good. The law is perfect. The law is pristine. But here's the thing. The law's whole purpose is to show you that you can't do it on your own. You know, I've said things and I really don't say things specifically for shock value. I really don't. But sometimes they come out that way. And I said, I've said a couple of times through the years that the Ten Commandments were never given for man to keep. Now, it, it's that, that sounds just totally, they'll baffle the religious mind. What are you talking about? My grandma made me memorize the Ten Commandments. The, my, you know, my Sunday school, it, it was plastered everywhere. You know, we'd have the Ten Commandments up in Burger King on the menu if we could, right? I, I mean, this, the, we've become so law-driven. Our society wants to know, tell me something to do and I'll do it. Tell me a way to be right and I'll do it. I'll be it. But here's the thing. The law was never given for man to keep. The law was given to show us that we could never keep it. And we need somebody better than us that can keep it so we can put our faith and our trust in him so we can receive his perfection and get back what Adam gave away when our innocence was redeemed and our innocence that was lost was totally bought back and restored. He gave that to us. And now by faith, we can receive that and walk it out. Oh, pastor, you just, you're against the Ten Commandments? Well, my goodness, no. But I'm telling you that they're holy. They're just. They're good. But following them pristinely all the days of your life can never, ever, 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 ever make you holy, make you just, or make you good. Only receiving Jesus' perfect sacrifice can do that. Only allowing the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to wash over and remit every single one of your sins can do that. Hallelujah. Can I get a good amen? Amen. So this is why Jesus preached the law, to shut their mouths, to literally shut their mouths and make every single one that heard his voice become guilty instantly. That's what the law does. Everything he preached was to show them that they needed him. And they got so mad at him for doing it that they killed him, which was the ultimate part of the plan. And had the enemy known, had Satan known that that's what was going to happen, the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians that he never would have crucified the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. So what do you mean, pastor? So we just don't live by the law? Well, no, we don't. Can you prove it to me? I'm glad you brought it up. (laughs) Since you brought it up, turn to Romans chapter 10. (laughs) I just want to say this right now for the record. I am 100% for everything that the law meant and represented. 100%. But I'm not for trying to keep any of it to be better before God. I can't do it. Romans chapter 10, verse 4 says this, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Everybody say, for righteousness. For righteousness, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end of the law where righteousness is concerned for everyone or to everyone that believeth it. Now, I still think it's a real good idea for everybody to remember not to commit murder today. <laughs> It's a real good one to remember. Don't forget that one when you leave church today. Don't lie. Honor your father and mother if you're blessed to still have them. Amen. Don't put any other gods before our God, right? All of those things are still awesome. Don't lust after your neighbor's stuff. Don't covet your neighbor's stuff. Be content with what things soever you have. Amen. All Every single one of part of the law is good. But now here's what the Apostle Paul says. Just go over to uh, three chapters there to Romans 13. Romans 13 verse 8 says, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath, Old English, means has already fulfilled the law. Now, how is that possible? I've had people say to me, didn't you just say that it's impossible to fulfill the law? Well, it is impossible to fulfill all of it probably all the days of your life, but it's not impossible for me to fill it 
fulfill it today in this situation and circumstance, and then the next day in that situation and circumstance, then the next day, and then the next day. Now, are you going to miss it sometimes? Of course. You're, you're going to get angry, and, and it's very possible that you could lose your temper. It's very possible that you may say something that you regret, okay? You get back on the forgiveness train, receive what Jesus did for you, and keep acting in love. Keep walking in love. Amen? But it says this, he uh, that loveth another has fulfilled the law. People say, oh, there's nobody can fulfill the law but Jesus. Well, it just here says that if you love your neighbor, you have fulfilled it. Have already. Hath fulfilled it, right? Verse 9, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, if there be any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. That's how Jesus fulfilled the law. He was so one with his father. He was so absolutely one with his father. God is love. The fulfillment of the law was walking out the love of his father, right? Right? Even down to the, I mean, the biggest decisions he could possibly have faced when he was right there in the garden, right before he went to the cross, he said, oh, Father, if there's any other way that I could do this, please let me know it now. Yeah. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He always submitted himself to love because he knew that it wasn't about him. It was about me. Yeah. It wasn't about him. It was about Candace. It wasn't about him. It was about Gary. It wasn't about Jesus that day. He, if it was about him, he said he could have called down 10,000 legions of angels at any moment, and he could have taken the first train out of here. And he did not do this for himself. He did it for you. Yes. Talk about love. Talk about loving your neighbor as yourself. Talking about going the extra mile and absolutely giving, giving everything. Giving everything. For somebody else. So there, there are different ways we could look at this. Our, you know, one of the texts that we, I guess, not really our key text today, but Matthew 6, I'm going to read it one more time. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. There's different ways we can read this. It says this, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Boy, it sounds awful lot like Jesus is preaching, uh, you know, conditions for forgiveness. Well, the amazing thing, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Okay, so Jesus, it sounds like he's preaching law. Well, maybe he is. That's one possibility here, right? There's really two possibilities. He's either preaching law or he's preaching grace. It sounds an awful lot like he's preaching law. But now, where grace is concerned, turn to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I want to share how the life of the believer is supposed to reflect this. The main part of this message today is what is your response to forgiveness? What is your response? 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So basically what he's saying here is when you love God and you've received his love, then you love your neighbor, period. Yes. Right? That's how this works. The fruit reveals the tree. The fruit reveals the tree. L listen, how many of you, I'm not a... Uh, Arborist, is that what that's a tree person, right? Arborist, did I get that right? Okay. I, I can't go outside now. I can tell a willow tree and I can tell an ash tree and I can tell a sycamore tree and a maple tree. I can look at leaves, but I don't know every tree, okay? <clears throat> I, I know some people, my uncle's really good at it. He can go out and he can tell you what a tree is. It's it's amazing. It's it's really amazing. But I don't know a bunch of trees. But now I can tell you this: if I walk up on a tree and there are about a thousand apples hanging from it. <laughs> My lightning fast mind knows really fast that that's an apple tree, right? I mean, I don't know. I, some people might call it just a, a gift. Maybe, I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm just gifted that way. <laughs> I've been uh, in Africa driving down the road and seen, uh, seen bananas on trees. And guess what? I knew those were banana trees. They looked a little bit different. They look very similar to plantain trees. 
when I was in Uganda, when I was in Kenya, when I've been different different countries. But you can see the leaf might fool you a little bit. Which one is that? Is that well? Oh, there it is. They're bananas. So it's a banana tree, right? So what what this verse of scripture is saying is the fruit reveals the tree. Amen. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. Jesus told us it's our job to be fruit inspectors. If you are to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove, don't leave that part out. But if you're to be wise as a serpent in this life, in dealing with people and not being conned and not allowing people to pull one over on you, being led by the Spirit, you better be really good. And I'm talking about pray that you get good at it quickly to learn to see people's fruit in their life. Yes. Now that, if you don't do it, harmless as a dove, you gotta get, forget the harmless as a dove part. Because if you forget that part, then you really quickly become judgmental. You become um, holier than thou. You become a narcissist because you start to think that your fruit is better than everybody else's fruit. And there's a lot of things that can come from that. So you cannot forget the part about walking in love. That is That is of utmost importance. But... Nevertheless, you've got to become really, really good at uh, knowing fruit in people's lives, being able to see fruit in people's lives and uh, walk in discernment where that's concerned. Because the proper new covenant order is for um, behavior to follow after uh, identity. The old covenant gets that backwards. In the old covenant, identity followed behavior. You do the right things and God would see you as the right person. But in the new covenant, behavior follows identity. Identity comes first. And so you've got to understand that every tree is bearing fruit. And the problem is most people in New Testament circles, they literally think it's their job to go around and get, get rid of all the bad fruit. If I can cut this fruit off my tree, then, then I'll look, you know, Whatever. And I gave the, um, the example one time, I don't know if you, the, the imaginary tree that I ran around one time a few years back, you know, cutting off fruit, right? Because if you have rotten fruit, if you have bad fruit, if you have unproductive branches and things like that, religion will say as fast as you can, run around the tree of your life and get rid of those things, cut those things off and allow all those stuff. So what ends up happening is you've got a tree that looks really good. Oh, hear what I'm saying. You have a tree, you're, you're, the tree that your life is looks really good. It looks appetizing. It looks like it has everything in order, but the root, the root of your tree is completely rotten and it's dead from the inside. How many of you have ever seen a tree that died on the inside, but it still looked alive on the outside? Right? We had one of those actually here. And uh, it can look good, and then all of a sudden one day it'll just fall right over, and the inside can be completely rotten, and it literally rot can rot from the inside out. Right? I've seen that happen before many times. So the, the problem is not corrected by being a fruit inspector in your life. Obviously, you need to be sensitive to the fruit that you're portraying, but you don't need to, you don't need to be on fruit patrol. You need to be on root patrol and your root needs to be. Now, listen, this is, has nothing to do. That's under the ground. It's under the soil. You cannot deal with the root yourself. That's why this is a faith life. You can't see the root. Come on, listen to me now. You can't see the root. It's not your job to make the root right. It's the heavenly father's job to make the root right by the Holy Ghost. And when the root is right, the fruit will be right. But if the root's wrong, you can do everything in your power and you will never get correct fruit in your life if the root's rotten. So it's not our job to do that. It's our job to lean on the, uh, the ability of Holy Spirit to make the root right. Amen? amen. Hallelujah. I said amen. amen. So proper covenant order is for identity to lead the way into behavior. So turn to Colossians chapter 3. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to read verse 13 today. Verse 13 says, now this is, this is Bible new covenant order for forgiving, amen? Verse 13 says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you, or do ye. So also you do. As Christ has forgiven you, has forgiven, has forgiven. Everybody say, has forgiven. has forgiven. As Christ has forgiven you, so you do. 
you forgive others. That's the proper new covenant way to do things. The old covenant says we act and then God acts. The new covenant says God acts and then we respond. Amen. I'm going to say that again. The old covenant says we act and then God acts. New covenant says God acts and we respond in faith to how he acted. If we don't respond, then the reality is for us, it's as if God never acted. I'm going to say that again. If you don't respond, then you are not receiving the benefit of what he did. That's why I say grace sets the table. Faith sits down and eats. If you don't sit down and partake of what grace already provided, then the meal means nothing to you. You can stand over here and you can say, man, that looks great. You can even walk around the table and get a good smell from every direction, however the wind is wafting and blowing. You can smell it, you can see it, but you'll never partake of it. It'll never nourish you and you'll never get the benefit of the meal if you don't sit down by faith and pick up a fork. Amen? I'll say it this way. I'll be bold enough to say it this way. Grace without faith is useless for you. I'm going to say it again. It got awful quiet in this Holy Ghost church. Grace without corresponding action, without faith, is useless for you. It's like the example that I gave of the two men that were, uh, you know, I guess it wasn't two men. I was one of them, and I was the uh, fish-flushing liar jerk. Remember two weeks ago? And... um, and, and if I if I flush your goldfish and I was, you know, and I was just rude to you, you can hold that over my head. But if you forgive me before I ask, again, not to go back to kind of give away for those of you that weren't here uh, two or three weeks ago, whenever I did this, I had everybody at the beginning of the sermon, raise your hand if you've ever forgiven somebody before they asked you to forgive them, yeah. right? And I think that everybody in the place has done that. But yet we think somehow that we're better than God. Oh, pastor, I would never do that. Well, if you don't think that he can pre-forgive you before you ask for it, then of course you're thinking that you're better than God. But certainly that's not the case. If you have enough foresight to understand that you need to release that person from whatever offense that was, because here's the bottom line, somebody wrongs you, guess what? I know people that are ruthless in this life. I know people who have said some absolutely horrible things about me and lied straight through their teeth about me. And guess what they do? I hear about it and I stew over it and I'm thinking, I didn't say that. I never said that. I don't even think that. Why would I much less say that? But now guess what they do? They go to bed and they sleep like a baby. (laughs) And I'm left thinking, I didn't say that. I'm telling you, I didn't say that. I, I, would, I don't even think that. Why? So here's what happens. They go on and live their life out of the fruit of their heart. I can't change, the, I can't change their root. So I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to go be a fruit picker in their life. I just told you, you're not even supposed to be a fruit picker in your life. You're supposed to deal with the root and let the fruit deal with itself. Hear me now. But if you don't ever get that where your own life is concerned, you're certainly not going to get it where your kids are concerned or where your neighbor's concerned or your coworker or your cousin is concerned or your brother's concerned or uncle so-and-so is concerned. You'll constantly be trying to fix them and deal with the fr- their fruit in their life. And you're, they're not even called to deal with the fruit in their life. They're called to deal with their own root. You need to hear what I'm saying. This is free. There are there is freedom in these words today. I'm telling you, if you'll just receive this, you'll be the one going home and sleeping like a baby tonight. Because you can release them from that. You can forgive them from that. Well, what if they never asked me? Then that's on them. Don't you don't even be concerned about it. Having unforgiveness in your heart is like drinking poison and expecting it to kill somebody else. That's just dumb. How, why would I ever hold something against somebody else and expect them to suffer for it? (laughs) It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. So, um, hallelujah. I'm going to read Matthew 6, 14 and 15 in the message Bible. I went ahead and typed it out today. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 in the message Bible, just, just for, uh, reference. I'll read it one more time. It's the last time today, but I'll read it one more time in the King James. 
Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In the Message Bible, it says, in prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You cannot get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. Yes. If you refuse to do your part, then you're not receiving what God has done. I just read a couple of verses of scripture, 1 John 4, 20, and uh, what was the other one? Colossians 3, 13. The proper new covenant order of things is as Christ has forgiven you, so also you forgive. But if you're not, then you don't have a revelation that you're forgiven. Yes. Amen. Amen? Amen? Unforgiveness, if you're taking notes, just write this down, please. Unforgiveness is a form of bondage. It's a grace killer. If you are unable to release forgiveness to others, you'll have trouble experiencing the forgiveness that God has released to you. God, I'm going to read that again. Unforgiveness is a form of bondage. It's a grace killer. If you are unable to release forgiveness to others, you'll have trouble experiencing the forgiveness that God has given to you or released to you. God acts, we respond. And then the fruit of our lives bears out that response. If you don't respond to what he has done for you, then as far as you're concerned, it'll be as if he's never done it. In the example of me, the goldfish flushing guy. If you don't, if I don't receive the forgiveness that you give me freely, if I don't receive it, for me, it's as if you never forgave me. I could walk around for 20 years and avoid you. When I walk down the street, go, go around the other side. Go a whole block around the other way just so I don't have to look you in the eye. I literally, as far as I'm concerned, it'll be like you never offered forgiveness in the whole time. You've offered forgiveness and are yearning for me to have relationship with you, to have fellowship with you. To, one puts a thousand to flight, two puts 10,000 to flight. You know, because you're good enough and you're smart enough and you're wise enough to know how, how powerful forgiveness is. You know that I could just absolute walk in total freedom if I'd receive it. But as far as I'm concerned, if I don't receive it, it's like you never offered it. That is a picture of how a lot of the church is living today. Oh, they're saved. They're going to heaven. They've received Jesus as Lord of their life, but they don't really understand that they're forgiven. They don't get it. What Jesus is saying here, um, man, there's, there's so much I want to share. Uh, <laughs> hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for wisdom on when to stop and when to keep going. Hallelujah, because I may have to make this a few more weeks. I, wh where we're going from here, just so you know, this series, Believe the Gospel, we started out on repentance because you have to change your mind to even receive it. Obviously, we're on week three here. There's clearly going to be at least one more week because I'm not going to have, I cannot get to 1 John 1, 9 today. I'll get to it next week. I'm going to deal with that because it says if, if, uh, if we repent, then he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, Right? If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now that's a New Testament verse that looks all, an awful lot like conditional forgiveness. So we'll talk about that next week, really probably in depth. But so we've talked about repentance. This, we're in the middle of this forgiveness, how to live it out, how to walk it out. But then we're going to conclude this series with a couple of weeks talking about living a life with no condemnation. See, that's what it is. You have to repent. You have to change your mind and receive and believe the gospel and receive that it's for you. Then you have to understand what forgiveness is like, learn how to walk it out with your neighbor, and then you can, only then can you truly live a life of freedom, a life of no condemnation where you can literally walk out and live out everything that the Lord Jesus literally gave his life, laid his life down so that you could walk in. You can't ever do it until you get these basic principles. These are the basic principles of being the righteousness of God in Christ. These are the principles that it's talking about in Hebrews chapter 6, where if you don't understand these things, verses 12 and 13, if you don't understand what these first, talk about these basic oracles of God, if you're still walking and eating, consuming the milk of the word, you have no idea 
what it means to be made the righteousness of God in Christ. This is, this is literally step one. And a lot of people then here, this is going to sound maybe a little harsh, but if you don't get this, these are the basics of the gospel. And most people don't even understand the basics of forgiveness. So we can have all the conferences we want to about faith, but faith works by love. We can have all the conferences we want to on seven steps to a powerful prayer life and, uh, you know, uh, all, all the different, I mean, walking in peace and living out the fruit of the Spirit, talk about the armor of God. We can have all of those we want, but if you don't understand that you're forgiven and deserve every bit of walking in that, then all of those other conferences are going to seem like seven steps that you'll never attain and you're going to live your whole life wondering, why doesn't this work for me? And the whole time, it's because you really don't think it belongs to you. That's not hard. That's Again, that's like Jesus saying what he said to, to the vipers, right? The religious people. It sounds harsh on its surface, on the face of it, but that's the most compassionate thing I can say to you. It's the most compassionate thing I can say to you whenever you're watching this. It might be 10 years from now. I don't know. But the most compassionate thing I can say to somebody is you've got to get this because you'll never understand the love walk if you don't understand that he's first loved you. Because we can only love because he first loved us. I can only forgive because he first forgave me. And so I can tell you to forgive your neighbor. I can tell you to forget. You can come in for counseling sessions and we can talk about forgiveness till I'm blue in the face. And we could have 17 counseling sessions about forgiveness. And you theoretically could be no different after session 17 as you were when you walked in the first session if you don't understand and fully grasp the fact that you've been forgiven and your slate is wiped clean. Because you can only live out of whatever you believe you have. That's the key. You can't give anything away that you don't believe you have. You can't take somebody else someplace that you haven't been. Come on now, this is, this is really good stuff. This is the bones. I mean, this is the absolute bones of what it means to be a believer. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's so much here. Mark, Mark chapter 11. I'm going to read another one that sounds really law-driven. Mark 11. We know verse 22, 23, and 24 real well, but how well do you know verse 25 and 26? Mark eleven twenty-five. 25. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Oh my goodness. There's another law verse, Anthony. There's another law verse, Pastor. What can you see there? Your forgiveness, getting forgiveness from your Father is completely a prerequisite for him forgiving you. Or for a, a prerequisite is you forgiving other people. Now, if you read the whole of the New Testament, the plan for salvation says nothing about that. When I was saved, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Now, when, I, when I really got, I, I might be a bad example. I gave my heart to the Lord at an early age. Um, I rededicated my life in college, and that's a whole other story. But how many of you got saved for illustrative purposes after age 20? How many of you gave your heart to the Lord after age 20? Okay, okay. So how about after age 30? Anybody? All right, one, two, we have a couple people. Now, so somebody in their 30s, now that was a commercial for kids' church. Bring your kids and grandkids to church because right there, most of you received Jesus at an earlier age, right? It, 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 that speaks volumes. But now let's say somebody that received Jesus in their 30s or beyond. Is it possible for Russ to receive Jesus later on in life? He just raised his hand. Is it possible for him to go back and forgive every person that he had awed against for 30 years? No. He probably doesn't even remember half of them on the football field that he held grudges against. And, and half of them, this guy played college football. I mean, this guy was some kind of athlete, and his son is too. But, I mean, can you imagine 30 years of trying to remember everybody that wronged you and going through the list? A pastor, I'd love to respond to that altar call, but I've I got to go home and think for a few weeks. I mean, I got to figure out this list has got to be at least three or 400 people long, preacher man. I, as soon as I get this all right, as soon as I forgive everybody, I'll come receive the Father's forgiveness. Well, no, that's not the new covenant way to get it done. So when Jesus, why right, we have to believe on the Lord Jesus, confess him Lord, right? Believe that he was raised from the dead, confess him with your mouth, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. That is whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I've read, I've known a couple people on their deathbed in their 80s and 90s received Jesus. I'm telling you right now, 
if they have to go make amends to everybody, half the people that they needed to forgive are already dead. <laughs> Guy 95 years old, all his, most of his friends didn't make it to 95. Most of his school buddies have already gone on to meet Jesus, right? So again, obviously we know that this isn't a prerequisite, but we read verses of scripture like this, and what the enemy does here, instead of allowing it to allowing ourselves to see it as it actually is of Jesus preaching to them to let them know that their mouths need to be stopped and all of the world can become guilty before God, he's pointing them to himself. Everything he said pointed to himself. When he's talking to his disciples on the side of the road about a fig tree, he's pointing them to him. When he's talking in the synagogue to all the re church religious leaders, he's pointing them to him. Yeah. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Yeah. I had other examples uh, one was the servant who went away. He was, uh, I think he was forgiven 10,000 of whatever, you know, talents or whatever. And he went away and, and wouldn't forgive the person uh, that owed him a hundred, right? So he was forgiven much, but he wouldn't forgive a little, right? So he was thrown back in jail. That is an example of a person that didn't have a changed heart. He didn't, re if he realized that somebody just forgave him 10,000, we'll say dollars, worth of debt, and he wouldn't go down the street and forgive a guy of $100 worth of debt? Hey, you got to realize, brother, you're $9,900 ahead. Just zip it and just be cool, all right? So it revealed his heart that he didn't understand what he had been forgiven. Uh, another place was the lady uh, in Luke chapter 7, the lady that broke the alabaster box and, and uh, understood that she, he said, your sins are forgiven. He said, actually, he said, your faith has brought you to this place. In verse 50, I think it is, uh, uh, Luke 7, I think it's verse 50. I can't see it right now. But um, he said, your faith got this for you. Now, Simon, they're at Simon's house. Simon the Pharisee, he's over there just thinking negative thoughts. Jesus perceived his thoughts. He was thinking if Jesus if were really a prophet, this guy says he's a prophet. If he were really a prophet, he would know whose hands are on him right now. And Jesus perceived his thoughts and said, now, let me ask you a question. Who needs Who's been forgiven more? He gave him, a, you know, he said two people. One was forgiven a, a big amount. He said, frankly, they're both forgiven the same, yeah. right? But now, really, really, we've all been forgiven the same. Yes. Say, as a believer, one of you goes out tomorrow and cheats on your taxes and to try and save 10000 from the IRS. Another one just goes out and cheats on a refill, pay for a water at, at a store and fill it up with Pepsi. I heard a lot of giggles. Do we think that one's okay? Do we think we can steal that? We can steal $2, but we can't steal 10000 right? They're both the same. They're both absolutely the same. Do you think that the person that gives his heart to Jesus on death row, that was a serial killer and killed 15 people, do you think that God forgave him of any more than he forgave me? No. The answer is no. Now, I know that that seems so contrary. Are you got to be kidding me, Pastor? What are you talking about? Both of those things kept me away from the Father. Yes. Ultimately, he forgives us all of the thing that keeps us away from fellowship with him. Yes. And when we start thinking for one minute that my sin's not as bad as your sin, now all of a sudden we've got to the worst possible place we can get like that. I mean, we just got there quick because all of a sudden you're telling me that your righteousness is dependent on what kind of you know, number we're talking about or what kind of sin we're talking about. It's like the guy that uh, met this beautiful woman and, uh, and said, you know, I'd really like to be with you. I think we're all adults in here. Said, I'll, I'll give you $100. She said, oh, what kind of a woman do you think I am? He said, I'll give you $1,000. She slapped him. What kind of a woman do you think I am? He got the $10 million and she said, well, okay, now let's talk about this. <laughs> He said, we've already determined what you are. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> the point of it is, you can think if you would have fallen for that, for that seduction at $1,000, you could think that that person's a worse person than you who would have done it for a million or more. The point being, we have a real problem at looking at somebody else and thinking that they've got it way worse than we do. Yes, that's right. We've got, our society has a problem. Our church society has a problem thinking 
that somebody else is way worse off than we are when the reality is every single one of us need Jesus. And I don't care if you've been saved 10 weeks or 10 years or five decades, 50 years. You need Jesus as much today to walk in his grace and to walk out everything he died to provide the same as you did the first day you received him. And the beauty of it is, is he, he is always I am. He's always at the ready right now to be the same as he always was. And I will close in saying this. So we, we read a verse like this and we think, is he preaching law or is he preaching grace? The truth is he's preaching both. How is it possible? How is it possible that he's preaching grace? Because here's the thing. If you, depending on what lens you're looking through, the lens you look through will always determine what you see. True. Hear me. I promise you I'm closing. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to close five times today. I promise. Just a couple more minutes. Okay. <laughs> If you're trusting in your own performance, you will read Jesus' words as law. Listen here. I must work to earn God's forgiveness. You can never succeed this way. Yes. However, if you're trusting in Christ's righteousness, you will read his words as an exhortation to walk in grace. The genius of Jesus, I'm talking about the absolute marvelous genius of Jesus, is he could walk into any situation, any circumstance. He could walk on the side of the road. He could be out in a boat on, you know, speaking to a multitude of people. He could be up in a mountain. He could be in a synagogue. He could be in a room with his disciples. He could be on a ship with them. Wherever he was, the genius of Jesus and the way that he communicated to people was that he could speak to crowds of people, 10,000 of them, and meet every single one of them right at the point where they were. I hope one of my sermons has done that. I, I, I believe they have. But I'm just saying, that's the ultimate, the ultimate goal for any believer talking to anybody about this new covenant, is for every single one of them to be hit right between the eyes, right where they are. Yes. He met everyone at the point of their need, the self-righteous and the hungry. He met the self-righteous and got the point across to them that they needed to hear about that, that they weren't good enough. He met the hungry right at the same point of their need and told them that he was enough. And the whole time he was telling the self-righteous that he was enough too. But first of all, he had to get through all their garbage and all their gunk and let them know that they weren't good enough. And then finally to convince them that he was. Praise the Lord. Amen. The words of Jesus, well, this is what I'll close with. The words of Jesus, if you're writing, taking notes, write this down. The words of Jesus will either reveal the self-righteousness that leads to death or the Christ righteousness that causes you to reign in life. Yes. And we saw, we saw a lot of things today. I'll just point out a couple of them. Remember Romans 3.19. The law is preached so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world will become guilty before God. Colossians 3.13, we read that today. It said that as Christ has forgiven you, so also you forgive. Ladies and gentlemen, the point is your response, your response has everything to do with what you believe you've received. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and share this video with a friend today. And remember, most importantly, that Jesus is Lord and you are complete in Him.